Let us pray. Our Father, as we come before you today, we're asking that you'll grant us understanding of the scriptures in Jesus' name. And we're asking that through what we'll see from your word, we'll live a life that is closer to you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Today we want to consider one of the great teachings of scripture, which unfortunately has been overlooked by many and misunderstood by others, and ignorance of God's dealings with man. On the area we are considering today has caused failure and backsliding in the lives of a number of Christians. Shall understanding that people have had concerning the teaching of scripture which we are going to examine today has resulted in the slow growth of many Christians. And sometimes so-called Christians have accused God foolishly because they do not know the purpose of God, neither do they know how to interpret some happenings in their lives. This important subject is the tests of life and faith. The tests of life and faith. There are those in Bible days and there are those in our time today who have missed God's perfect plan for their lives because they failed at an unsuspected hour. Others remain in the kingdom of God but they are permanently crippled and they cannot make much progress. As we talk about tests, we must distinguish between temptation and testing. God does not tempt man with evil, but he uses different circumstances in our lives to test how well we have learned our lessons from scripture. To show that he does not tempt us with evil, we turn to James chapter 1. Verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man, any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. The passage of scripture we have read here is talking about temptation to evil. It's talking about enticement to sin. And the Bible says, whenever you are considering temptation in the sense of being tempted to do evil, Whenever you are considering temptation in the sense of being enticed to do to commit sin, understand that God cannot tempt a man to do evil. On the same line, Jesus was teaching disciples and he taught us in the same passage on how to pray. And that prayer reveals that God has no hand in leading us into evil or into temptation or enticement to sin. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 and 13. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Verse 13. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The power of God and the glory of God is used in preserving us from evil. He never deliberately, directly lead us into evil. In John chapter 17, verse 15, here Jesus was talking to the Father, and he was talking to the Father about the disciples, about the children of God. In John 17, 15, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Again, it is very clear 
from what we have read that the Lord does not tempt with evil, he does not lead into evil, he never entices men or seduces men to evil. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, there is no temptation taking you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Again, we are being told here that the only involvement God has with temptation, when you consider temptation to evil, enticement to sin, is to deliver from temptation, to protect from temptation, and to make a way of escape for his own children who are trusting him to escape evil and temptation. But then, as we have said, even though God does not tempt anyone with evil, he does use different circumstances in our lives to test how well we have learned our lessons in Scripture. Now, when we talk about test, the Scriptures from the Old Testament to the New Testament uses a number of words. It uses the word test, it uses the word try, it uses the word prove. And the use of these three words mean actually the same thing. You are tested, or you are tried, or you are proved. Much the same way that a teacher will test a student. Anywhere you find a teacher teaching, a time will come in the life of the students that have been taught when the teacher will test. Now the test of a teacher is not enticing a student to do evil. The test of a teacher is not luring a student to do evil. The test of a teacher is finding out how well the student has learned his lesson. And in the same way, God as our great teacher, God as the one that is establishing us and improving us and maturing us, he will test us to see how well we have learned our lessons. In that way, the scriptures abundantly prove that the Lord tries and tests and proves the hearts and the actions of men and women. To tempt, no. To test, yes. In Psalm 17, reading in verse 3. Psalm 17, verse 3. Thou hast proved mine heart. That is, you have examined the very depths of the thoughts of the desires of my heart. You have proved my heart. Thou hast visited me in the night. Thou hast tried me, tested me, examined me, and shall find nothing. I am purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. In Psalm 66, verse 10, For thou, O God, hast proved us. You have examined us, and you have tried to discover what is within us. Thou hast tried us as silver is tried. For what purpose is silver tried? For the purpose of knowing whether it is genuine or counterfeit? For the purpose of knowing whether it is solid or it is mixed with strange elements? For the purpose of knowing whether the silver will be profitable and, and useful or not? And for that purpose, that same purpose, God tries and tests us. And it says, For thou, O God, has proved us, thou hast tried or tested us, as silver is tried. In Proverbs chapter 17, verse 3, the 
refining pot or the refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold but the Lord tries examines tests the hearts of men in Jeremiah chapter 17 reading verses 9 and 10 the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it before the heart is tested before our actions are examined and before our lives are proved by God we seem to feel we're very strong we seem to feel we have great faith we seem to feel that we're loving God with all our heart all our soul all our mind but God said that heart is so deceitful that even the person that is having the heart does not know it then he says in verse 10 I the Lord search the heart he does not tempt with evil but he searches the heart and I try the reins even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings again you can see from the clear testimony of scripture that God tests man God tries the ways of man and he makes man himself to discover from the tests how he has been doing you know at school at times that a student looks a sharp and uh, the student will regularly attend classes and it appears that the student is the one that pays the most attention in class it appears actually that student might be judged without a test without any examination that student might be judged as the best student in the class but then the test comes and that student realizes and discovers and everybody discovers in the class that actually the student even though he was always in the class he had learned nothing he wasn't actually assimilating what you thought he was learning and in the same way there are those who profess to be Christians on the surface just looking at them you'll think they are the best Christians you have ever met before the tests come before their hearts are tried before their lives are tested before God refines them and tests them and tries them like silver is tried to see whether they're genuine or counterfeit to see whether they are profitable or useless before the test comes you'll think they're all right only the tests in life make us to discover who we are what we have who we know and what we know in James chapter 1 verses 3 and 4 knowing this that the trying of your faith worketh patience you know we profess to have a great faith wait until it is tested we profess to have a great commitment to the Lord wait until it is tested knowing this that the trying of your faith worketh patience but let patience have a perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire wanting or lacking nothing in first Timothy chapter 3 first Timothy chapter 3 from verse 6 Paul the Apostle was talking of those who should be involved in serious work for the Lord and he had given some qualifications in um, chapter 3 verses 1 to 5 and then Paul the Apostle said there will be people who appears to be who appear to be having these qualifications they have not been long in the church and it will appear that looking at them on the surface they have one why they are blameless they're vigilant they're sober they have good behavior they're given to hospitality they are apt to teach they're not even given to wine they are patient they're not covetous and it appears for the short time you have met and known them it appears that they rule their houses well but then he says 
if there has not been enough time to test them, if there has not been enough time to prove them, don't get them involved in the serious, deep, weighty, heavy work of God. Because it says in verse 6, not a novice. Somebody who has not been proved, somebody who has not been tested, somebody, somebody who has not been exposed to the circumstances of life for us to know and for him to discover what are the things actually in his life. The fruit on that tree may be so new, may even look so big and look so nice, but it might not have matured yet. But then when the sunshine comes and the rain falls and the storm comes and the, the test of life, that tree has undergone age, then will you know whether those fruits are actually dependable or not. Therefore not in novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into the reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not giving to much wine, not greedy or filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Then look at verse 10. And let these also first be proved. Let these also first be proved. Let me remind you, the teacher will teach the students then they will test the students and then the teaching and the testing all come together to mean the training for that student and if the student will pass the exam or the test for this uh, period then that, that student will be promoted will be given a certificate will be sent forward if that student will fail the student will be, have discovered he has not learned what he should have learned for the year and the teacher will want to make him learn that before he goes forward. What does the parent do for the children? The parents will teach the children at home, informally yet real. And then the parent will test to know whether the child had grasped the lesson that he had been taught. I mean lessons of life. What does the technician do for uh, the people that are learning under them? In a particular trade, the technician will expose the, uh, te the people that have been trained to tests, assignments, practical uh, things that are given out. And if these uh, people show that they have actually learned by doing the work well, then they move forward and they learn another thing. God does the same thing to mature us, to establish us, to confirm the grace of God in our lives. And so he says in verse 10, let this also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon after you have found them blameless. So then, both in the Old and the New Testament, we find it very clearly stated that God tries the hearts of men. He tests men. God's purpose and plan is to train us, to establish us, to mature us. Sometimes the lessons have been learned theoretically, but then he brings us onto the practical side, just like the teacher will teach and test and train the children, the students. So he gives us practical problems to solve, so as to determine our progress. In the school of life, Promotion comes only when we have successfully shown that we have learned and grasped what we were previously taught. And God gives opportunities to us to manifest the fruit of the Spirit. You know, in church you learn memory verses, you hear sermons, and it appears that everybody in the church is actually learning. You have got saved, your sins are forgiven, you are now on your way to heaven. And you say, well, I thank God, I know the fruits of the Spirit. You know them theoretically. You know them, you know the reference where, it, where they can be found. Perhaps you even know the explanation. But then the practical side of our training is when the test comes. When the test comes. Only then do we discover how much we have known. How much we have got. If the love is there. If the joy is there, 
if the peace is there, if the long suffering, the gentleness, the goodness, the faith, the meekness, the self control, or the temperance, if they are all there. Only the tests in life will show whether they are there or not. And so these tests we're talking about today, and uh, the type of test we have read in the life of Abraham when the Lord tested him and told him to bring his son. These tests are the things that give us opportunities to manifest the fruit of the Spirit or to show our maturity or immaturity. To prove our consecration or lack of consecration. To reveal our commitment or lack of commitment. To reveal our understanding of Scripture or lack of understanding. And to show that obedience to God is a priority of our lives. You know, it is when the tests come that actually we have an opportunity of showing our maturity, proving our commitment, revealing our understanding, and showing that obedience is a priority of our lives. There will be every opportunity for us in life to prove what we know and who we know. To prove who we really are and what we have in the tests that come to us in life. How would you know whether you have learned the lessons of life and faith? How would you know whether, for example, the humility we have talked about, we have learned about, we have read the Bible about, you have recited memory verse about, how would you know whether the humility is there or not? By checking up in your brain whether you still remember the verse? No. By trying to find a place where it is in the Bible? No. It is only when a circumstance comes in your place of work or in your home, or between you and your husband, or in the church between you and a fellow believer, that you have an opportunity of knowing whether you have really thoroughly learned the lesson of humility. That's the test. How would you know whether you have learned the lesson on endurance? Well, if, any dif if difficult situations never come, that will test your endurance or self-denial, how would you know whether you have learned that lesson or not? You know, the basic Bible doctrines. It's, uh, you know, sometimes easy for us to have um, a retreat and then you call a young man and you tell him to teach on how to find a life partner. And uh, you see it under his teaching and it goes from the Bible and it goes from Genesis on through to the many books of the Old Testament and the New Testament and it goes to Revelation and by the time he finishes talking for one whole hour you say, what a talking Bible that it appears he has the whole Bible inside his heart and this young man has never got married but he knows all the references, he knows the doctrine, he knows everything you can find about how to find the will of God in marriage. How to pray, how to drop all the idols, how to depend upon God, how to seek the face of God, how to search until God will tell you. How will you know? He wants to give seven points on how you will know that this is the will of God. And by the time he finishes for that one hour teaching and sweating and preaching and really effective, you say, that man, he knows the Bible. But wait for him until he wants to get married before you know that he knows the Bible. Because being able to recite the verses, being able to quote the references, is not an evidence that that man or that, um, that brother has learned the lesson on getting married. It is when the test comes, when the opportunity comes, that then you will know whether he has really learnt it or not. Does he know how to wait upon God? Not by fighting, finding the quotation in the Bible, but by actually waiting upon the Lord. Does he know how to be patient, waiting for the Lord, until the Lord will reveal, and he will do it without, and he will find the will of God without making any mistake? Not because he's quoting the Bible references, but because now the test of life has come and is able to pass that test. You know, sometimes um, you confront a believer and uh, you say, what does the Bible say about forgiving our enemies and forgiving the people that offend us? And uh, immediately he sits you down. And without getting prepared before, he can lecture you on forgiveness. Does that mean he has learned his lesson? No. 
It's only when the practical situations of life come that you will know whether that lady or that man has learned a lesson on forgiveness. How about love? How about patience? How about faith? How about obedience? How about contentment? How about honesty? How about submission to church leadership? How about submission to the husband? How do we know whether we have learned the lessons or not? By quoting the Bible? By preaching the Bible? By writing a tract? No. When you go through circumstances in life, circumstances that test you, that try you, circumstances that prove your heart and you are able to successfully uh, sail through it is then we know that you have actually learned only our attitudes responses and reactions when the tests come can give the answer to the question as to whether we have learned or we have not learned you remember in the case of abraham the lord told him bring your only son sacrifice that son to me and abraham went along the challenges came the question came from the son isaac he answered the question yet he went steadily on until he laid the child on the wood and he stretched out his hand to offer that son to the lord and then the voice came and stopped him and in Genesis chapter 22, verse 12. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know. Now I know. By your attitude, now I know. By your response of obedience, now I know. By the spontaneity of uh, your obedience to me, now I know. By the quick way in which you have responded to what I told you, now I know. By not drawing back, but just giving unto me the son I requested from you, now I know that thou fearest God. Seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. How will the Lord know that we have love? When the test comes to test our love and we love, now I know that you love. You love God, you love the word of God, you love the church, you love the people of God, you love your enemies. How will the Lord know that we actually can forgive when the situations come and uh, we respond favorably and we actually forgive without any grudge in the heart anymore? Now I know. You know, many times uh, we say, Oh, I thank God for this church. I am committed in that church. Till I die, I will serve my God in that church. Does that mean that man is consecrated? Not actually. When the test comes, when situations come in that same church, that will test his commitment, test his consecration, test all that he has been verbalizing, all he has been saying. It's only then God will say, now I know that you are really committed to me in that church. You see, that is the test of life. And it comes upon everyone. And I, I want to just take you through the scriptures on six different areas of course there are more areas than this in scripture and in life but i just want to cover these six areas in our lives where we are tested and then our responses and our reactions will show whether we actually love the lord or not these six areas number one deception of prophets whenever such a thing comes it is because the Lord is opening up an avenue, a way, whereby we can be tested. And you know there are many things to test in our lives. When our students go to school, they learn, uh, sometimes they learn up to 14 subjects. And at the end of the year, the timetable is drawn. But you know the thing is that just for about two weeks or three weeks, all those 14 subjects will be tested. And uh, the higher you go, the smaller the uh, number of subjects become. And eventually, when you are specializing, a student is maybe just to be tested in uh, four different areas. Or is going to just have four papers or five papers. And then he's tested in those areas. But you know, there are a lot of things to test in our lives. And there are many lessons that the Bible has taught. Think about the lesson on 
the sovereignty of God, the power of God, the faithfulness of God. Have you learned the lesson? The testing time will tell. Think about repentance and restitution. Have you learned the, have you learned the lesson? Opportunities will tell. Think about holiness of life in private and in public. Have you learned the lesson? Well, circumstances in life will show whether you've learned the lesson or not. Think about the doctrine of the Bible on marriage. Have you learned the lesson? A testing time will come. There are many subjects to be tested in your life and in my life. Think about faith. Oh, abundant opportunities. When our faith will be tested, our dependence upon God will be tested. Think about um, worldliness, what the Bible has taught you against uh, worldliness. Have we, have we learned the lesson? Well, the testing time will show. You think about patience, contentment, honesty, humility in our lives. All these things will have opportunities of their being tested. And you know, the test is not just for one week in the year. Students know that at the end of the session, they will be tested and they are preparing for it. But you know, in the Christian life, God comes just at any time, at any season. And he doesn't test all the subjects at the same time. You know, sometimes a Christian is uh, specializing on faith. And he's saying, well, I want to know in the Bible everything the Bible has to say about faith, about prayer, about casting out devils, about commanding the devil and the devil obeying, about healing the sick. All through this period, I'm going to learn about faith. And then the test is coming on love. And he fails that test because he doesn't know that uh, the testing time is going to come. And you know, another time is learning on, you know, just how to be aggressive and do evangelism and reach out. And he says, Lord, I'm now getting ready. I'm learning the Bible on evangelism. And the test is going to come on sitting down and being patient. Think about it. Think about it. That is why in your life, you must be ready all the time. Because the Lord is not going to announce before time that now, next week, like we announced to students, I'm going to test you on love. No, it comes suddenly. It comes anytime. And blessed are those people who are ready and prepared at any time. And they pass the test whenever the Lord is bringing the test in their life. In one area, deception of prophets. An area like that, the Lord will bring a test. Number two, difficulties in poverty. You wonder, uh, why does poverty sometimes come in a believer's life? Isn't God able to supply all our needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus? He is able, but there may be a testing time. Number three, the delicacy of prosperity. Number four, delay of promises. Number five, days of pressure. Days of pressure. Number six, decision on priorities. Decision on priorities. You see, in all these various areas, the Lord tests us. He tests our lives. Now, you test um, a student for a number of reasons. You know, you've been in school before most of us have been. Sometimes uh, the teachers are watching and the teachers are testing and uh, sometimes they are not even testing for academic um, understanding or knowledge. They are testing the strength of character. They want to know who they will choose as senior prefect in a few weeks' time. And therefore, they are closely watching the students. And the aptitude test they give them, and the other practical test they give them, is to show who can really coordinate and, and uh, be a prefect over all these people. And you know sometimes God is looking for people that he will use in strategic positions. And because of that, test will come. And I'm sure, you know, many Christians have made uh, these mistakes. I've seen Christians who made this type of mistake before. They feel, if God is going to use me, all I need to do is, uh, you know, lock myself up and study my Bible and cram the Bible. No many verses of the Bible. No. That's all theory. Cram the Bible on the theory of love, not practice of love cram the Bible on the theory and the doctrine of forgiveness and cram the Bible on how to pray, in whose name to pray and who we are to pray to. All that is theory. And all those hours you are spending locking yourself up and reading the Bible and saying, oh God, I'm getting prepared. You are going to use me in a mighty way. 
God says, well, keep planning and keep coming. When you get ready for your test, come out and mix with your brothers and sisters. Then they will push you. I will know whether you've learned your lessons. They will tread upon you. They will Sometimes they will unknowingly offend you. Then I will know whether you have really learned your lesson. It is not what you do when you are locking yourself up in the house, studying the Bible, cramming the Bible, that will make God to raise you up as a senior prefect among all the other students of the Bible. It is what happens while you are mixing with your fellow students of the Bible that will make God know whether you have learned your lesson or not. And you know, in our places of work, there are assignments that are given, practical assignments, you know, to give unto people to know whether they merit promotion or not. You know, God tests us like that. And in the tests that come our way, our reactions show whether we're qualified for something higher, something greater or not. Deuteronomy chapter 13, Deception of Prophets. Deuteronomy chapter 13, from verse 1. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign of the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known. Let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you, tests you. The Lord your God is trying you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You know, after you have been learning the doctrines of the Bible, you know there are people that have learned the doctrines of the Bible for five years, for ten years, for twenty years, and then all of a sudden a false prophet will rise up. And this false prophet will have... Um, an ability to talk well, ability to convince people in the erroneous way. And this person who has been learning the Bible for 20 years, 25 years or 30 years, will just all of a sudden switch over and go into false doctrine. What has happened? He has failed the test. All through those years, he thought he was learning the Bible, but now the test has come and he has fallen down flat. Falling down flat. Because it says that, that dreamer, or that prophet will come and will give you a wonder or a sign and then will show you let us do it another way let us serve another god let us discover power in another way and then the lord says in verse 3 don't listen don't hearken because you know all that you are hearing it's just a test of your understanding, a test of your maturity, a test of your dependence upon God, a test of the knowledge you have of the infallibility of Scripture and the constancy of the doctrines of the Bible. It's a test. It's a test. And if you deviate from the sound doctrine of the Word of God at that time, at that time of difficulty, at that time of trial, at that time of testing, it means you have failed. That's why the Apostle said in First John chapter 4, in verse 1, First John chapter 4, verse 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit. If you have actually been learning the lessons, if you have actually been reading the Bible, if you have been a real student of the Bible, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. In Hebrews chapter 13, Verse 9, be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that they had be established with grace, not with meat, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. So, the doctrines of the Bible will be tested in your life, because deception will come, deceivers will come, false prophets will come. They may come through their cassettes, they may come through their books, they may come through their pamphlets, they may come through their crusades, they may come through their radio television ministry, they may come in any way. And the Lord will not block your ears and close your eyes and tie your hand and close the door of your house so that these things will not come in. In fact, the Lord will just deliberately allow them to come in. And then you'll hear that uh, there's another alternative about getting married. And these other people will talk in such a sweet way, in such a wonderful way. 
and the, these people will talk and tell you that well you know after you have divorced uh, God has forgotten all about that you can marry another person now and it will look so convincing and the Lord will even allow you to listen to that and to hear that and then but you will not realize it is, it is a test of what you have been learning if at that time you are able to stand clinging to the Lord, cleaving to the Lord that means you have learned your lesson and then certificate will come promotion will come praises and commendation will come then the Lord will put you forward there will be progress in your Christian life in your Christian race but if at that time you say is that so? all these years I didn't know that uh, it's alright to marry a second wife then you're already accepting the false doctrine you are, you are tested and you have failed let's move on there are times of poverty and there are difficulties in poverty and uh, at these times you know God is able to supply but then sometimes the Lord will wait for a day you have been saying oh I'm going to go on with God the rest of my life I have discovered there is a deeper life church where you can worship God without fear, without favor, where you can worship God with all your heart. And, uh, you know, while the food is there, while the clothing are there, while the work is there, while the employment is there, while the friends are there, oh, you'll be saying, I, I, I will never miss any church service. On Thursday I'll be there, on Sunday I'll be there, on Monday I'll be I just love the Lord. And you know, that our pastor, I love our pastor. In our family, we pray for him every week. And every time we just pray for him as a leader, oh, that man is just wonderful. I will never forget that type of church. I'm going to be there until Jesus comes. All of a sudden, poverty comes. No food, nothing to eat. And your clothes are just, uh, you know, getting tattered and dirty on you. And the work has gone. And you are served a quick notice. And the Lord is there up in, the, up in, the, in heaven. He knows what to do. He knows where to get another job. He knows where to get food. He knows where to get accommodation. But he says, well, let's wait a little. He's been saying, he'll follow God. He'll serve God. He'll be in that church. And he likes everybody in that church. Let's wait a little. One day, one week, one month. Difficulties in poverty. It's a test. And if you pass that test... It will be wonderful. There will be another certificate you receive. There will be promotion and progress. If you fail that test, then the Lord would have known that all these things you were saying all these days, you didn't really believe what you said you believed. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2, And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee. To know what is in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. You see, that's the purpose of God. When he doesn't, um, you know, give that thing the very day you're looking for it. When he doesn't change that circumstance, the very day you are telling him to change it, and he waits a little for some hours, God has a purpose to humble you. God has a purpose to test you, to prove you, and to know what is in your heart. Whether you will keep his commandments or no. In verse 15. Who led thee through the great and terrible wilderness. Wherein were fairy serpents and scorpions and drought. Drought is famine. Where there was no water. Who brought thee forth? Who brought thee forth? Water out of the rock of fleet. Who fed thee ways in the wilderness. With manna which thy fathers knew not. Might humble thee. That he might prove thee. To do the good at thy latter end. Why does the teacher test the students? To do the students good at the latter end. Why does God test his own children? To do them good at the latter end. You know, the great things of heaven cannot be just distributed to everybody, every day can hurry like that. There are some uh, blessings to get at the edge of the kingdom of God. You know, you are just entering and you are on the surface. You are not deep yet. Even though you are in deeper, but you are not deep yourself. Your commitment is not deep. You are just on the surface. Just on the surface following the Lord. Well, there are some blessings you will receive while you are on the surface. But when you get into the deep and you are covered all over by the knowledge of the word of God 
and you are committed to the marrow of your bone, to the blood in your body, you are committed to obedience to the word of God, you get into the death of blessing you never discovered before. But how will God know that you have got into that death? By testing you. And in the difficulties that come with poverty, you know, at such times, the test uh, just come. And if you pass that test, wonderful things will be happening. In um, Psalm 81, verse 7, Thou callest in trouble, and I delivered thee. I answered thee in the secret place of thunder. I proved thee at the waters of Meribah. That is, the Lord was telling them, You children of Israel, did you know that since you came out of Egypt, you have taken many examinations? Can I show you your report sheet? All these times, you know when there was no water, you know what you did? You grumbled and murmured. Was that a pass mark or failure? Of course, failure. You know when there was no, when there was no food? All the manna was ready in heaven. The angels were ready to pour down the manna. But I told them, wait a little. Let those people feel some bite of hunger in them. Let me see how they will act. You know, I've tested you. What did you do? You grumbled and murmured. Eventually, I sent manna. But was that a past mark of failure? You failed. And when those people went into the land of Canaan, and they came back to report, we saw giants in that place. Then I waited for you to see what your reaction will be. You know what you did? You cried and wept like baby. And you said, well, choose another captain and go back to Egypt. Was that a past mark of failure? Failure. Israel, I have tested you. By the rock, by the waters of Meribah, in the place of the wilderness at um, Kadesh Barnea, I have tested you all along. And you have failed every test I have given you. Think about it. Do you even know that since you started your Christian life, that some circumstances have been allowed in your life to just test you and test you and test you? I told you about deception of prophets. They are tests. If you refuse the deception, if you hold on to the doctrines of the Bible, if you say, no, this is what the Bible says and I'm standing by it, you are passing the test. I've told you about difficulties in poverty. If you stand... The test has come and then you stand. Now let me talk to you about the delicacy of prosperity. You know the children of Israel? In Exodus chapter 15, there was uh, no water. But in Exodus, then when there was no water, they failed. In Exodus chapter 16, there was an abundance. But then when the abundance also came, they also failed. Think about it. A man that uh, fails at a time of poverty... And then prosperity has come now, and you think, well, no doubt he will pass the test now. Because this is prosperity, and he fails the test again. Think about it. A man that has not got married, and because of the loneliness, he fails the test, the test of life. He disappoints God. Now he has got married, and there is fellowship, and there is love, and there is uh, everything he wants in the home. Again, he fails God. When is he ever going to pass? In prosperity, he fails. In poverty, he fails. At the time he has not got married, he fails. At the time he gets married, he fails again. When he has not got any child and the test came, he failed. When the child has now come in answer to prayer, he fails again. When there was no job, he failed. And when job has come, he has failed. When he had no car, he failed. And when a car has come, he failed. When is he ever going to pass the exam of his life? Exodus chapter 16, verse 4. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I rain bread from heaven for you. Rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. Look at verse 16. This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Gather ye it every man, gather of it every man according to his sitting, and Omer for every man, according to the number of your persons. Take ye every man for them which are in his tents. And the children of Israel did so, and gathered some more, some less. And when they did measure, or they did meet it with an omer, 
He that gathered much had nothing over. He that gathered little had no lack. They gathered every man according to his sitting. And Moses said, Let no man leave of each till the morning. He said, Now children of Israel, you've been praying and asking, How will God they do it? How will God supply it now? The Lord has supplied it, but everything God has provided for today, eat everything. And they don't leave uh, uh, don't leave any part of it until the morning. What's that? Another test. A test of faith. Will they be able to know that God is faithful? If he provided today, he'll provide tomorrow. Will they know that if God has power to give that thing today, that power will never fail, he'll give it tomorrow? Let's see if they pass that test. Verse 20. Notwithstanding, they hearkened not unto Moses. But some of them left of it until the morning, and it bred worms and stank, and Moses was wroth with them. Some of them said, This God, thank you, you've given us today, but uh, nobody knows tomorrow. This is how these uh, leaders and preachers will be telling us, God is wonderful, God is wonderful, God is wonderful. Eat everything you have now, God will provide tomorrow. If you wait for them, your children will be hungry tomorrow. Mm, I'll take care of my life. And then they kept some of it. What's that? Failure? Their faith had been tested, they failed. They didn't know it was a test. Because God didn't say, now children of Israel, let's have another test. And this time, we're going to test not your endurance. At the time of poverty, God was testing their endurance. At a time of prosperity, God was testing their faith and confidence in God. And you know, they kept it until the morning. And Moses said, what type of people are these? When there is no water, you fail. When there is water, you fail. When there is no food, you fail. When there is food, you fail. No matter what and no matter where and no matter how, you always fail. What will I do with you? In verse 21, And they gathered it every morning, every man according to his sitting. And when the sun waxed hot, it melted. And it came to pass on, that, on the sixth day, that they gathered twice as much bread, two omas for one man, and all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses, and he said unto them, This is that which the Lord has said, Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which ye, ha which ye will bake today, and seize that which ye will see. And that which will remain over, lay up for you to be kept until the morning. And they laid it up uh, till the morning, as Moses bade, and did not stink, and neither was there any worm therein. And Moses said, Eat that today. For today is a, sa is a Sabbath unto the Lord, a resting day. Today ye shall not find it in the field. Six days ye shall gather it. On the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be none. Verse 27. Now, have they learned the lesson? After all, Moses, the man of God, the prophet of God, has not talked to them. And everybody heard it. Have they all learned it? Let's see the practical. Let's see the test. Verse 27. And it came to pass that there, were, there went out some of the people on the seventh day to, for to gather, and they found none. You see that? Even while God was caring for them, how they were missing God all the time. Point number four. When are we also tested in our lives? You see, these are not temptations to evil. You know, sometimes in the believer's life, when a lady comes and he wants to tempt that man who is now a believer into sin, he runs away. He has passed the test of that temptation. And there are times when people are saying, come and do evil. Oh, you say, no, I will not commit sin. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. But apart from temptation, there are tests. And these tests are just to know how convinced you are of the God of the Bible, to know about your faith and your love and your forgiveness and the basic Bible doctrines, to know whether you will stand firm or not. You know, there are times of delay of promises. God has given you promises and is delaying the fulfillment. You have uh, read the word of God every soul, the, every place the soul of your foot shall tread upon. That have I given to you. And you are claiming it. You claim a hundred promises in one week. And God fulfilled only four. 
out of 100. The next week he fulfilled another one. The next week he fulfilled another one. And um, a number of the promises you have claimed are still being delayed. You know that is a test. That is a test to know what you will do. How you will react. How you will respond. And you will say, well, how long will I wait? How long will I be telling God? I've cried until all the tears in my head have come out. I have fasted until all my intestines are, blo are uh, you know, smeared together and uh, no strength anymore. I have prayed until all my knees are as hard as anything and I've claimed all the promises. And my, my Bible is totally wet with my tears. God, what are you looking at? Well, the delay of promises to test who you are and what you are and what you have and where your faith is. Delay of promises. Look at Judges chapter 2. Judges chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 21. I also will not henceforth drive out any from before them of the nations which Joshua left when he died, that through them I may prove Israel. You know, it's a test. Through them I may prove or test Israel whether they will keep the way of the Lord to walk therein as their fathers did or not. Therefore, the Lord let those nations without driving them out hastily. He will drive them out, but not hastily. Neither delivered he them into the hand of Joshua. Chapter 3, verse 1. Now, these are the nations which the Lord left to prove or to test Israel by them, even as many of Israel as had not known all the wars of Canaan. You know, he had given them the promise. And then slowly and steadily and gradually, bit by bit, he was driving the enemy nations away from them. But he didn't drive everything away in one day. What did they want? Well, just what you would have wanted if you were there. For God to fulfill all the promises in one day. You know, give you that job in one day, that car in one day, that house in one day, and get your wife gets uh, pregnant uh, that same week, and everything is just all right for that uh, one week, and uh, all you will ever get from heaven, you get it in one week. Well, that's what the average uh, person is looking for. And we'll say, isn't God wonderful? Isn't God very nice? And yet God is looking for another thing. He says, well... I'll not do everything hastily. I'll give him one by one, gradually and slowly. I'll fulfill those promises just one at a time. And I will see whether he'll be patient waiting for me, whether he will appreciate me and love me for the things I have done, whether he will not grumble and just praise me and worship me for the glorious and the gracious things I've done in his life. You know, that's what happened in the life of the children of Israel. There was the delay of the promises. But because of the delay, many of them failed the law. They failed the Lord. But understand, my brother, my sister, many delays in our lives are just to test our lives. To test of what fiber we are made of. In uh, 1 Samuel chapter 10, we are reading about the life of Saul, the first king of Israel. 1 Samuel chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 6. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, Samuel talking to Saul. And thou shalt prophesy with them, and shall be turned into another man. And let it be, when these signs are come unto thee, that thou do as the occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. And thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I will come down unto thee to offer burnt offerings, and to sacrifice sacrifices of burnt of a peace offerings. Seven days shalt thou tarry. Seven days shalt thou tarry. Seven days shalt thou tarry, till I come to thee, and show thee what thou shalt do. Brother, have you found the will of God in marriage? And then you are told, Now, brother, why don't you sort of uh, wait for us? Let us check up. Maybe just about seven days will be all right. Let's check up. Oh, be very quick. Uh, you are wasting my time. I know the will of God. And God has convinced me. In fact, I believe the sister knows it already. Okay, wait. Just seven days will be all right. 
and you are not even able to wait one day you say well i don't trust all those people i don't know what they are going to do i don't want to know what they are going to tell that lady when they interview her and then you go the second day and you say sister uh, as the lord not been talking to you i know the will of god give me the answer now now and the sister says okay i will pray or have you seen the marriage committee no no marriage committee we're children of god tell me now now okay i will uh, i will pray then i will get in touch with you then one hour later he comes back have you got the answer uh, you saw me just one hour ago i have not got the answer uh -uh. are you not a child of god is it difficult like that to, to hear the voice of god i hear the voice of god every time i told you one hour ago if you are really serious with god you should have heard the voice of god you are failing the test of your life my brother that's failure you know samuel told saul and he said seven days wait for me and uh, this king of israel in uh, first samuel chapter 13 let us see first samuel chapter 13 let's read from verse 5 and the philistines gathered themselves together to fight with israel thirty thousand chariots and six thousand horsemen and people as the sand which is on the seashore from in multitude and they came up and uh, pitched in mikmash eastward from beth haven when the men of israel saw that they were in a strait for the people were distressed then the people did hide themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks and in high places and in peace and some of the hebrews went over jordan and to the land of god and gilead as for saul he was yet in gilgal according to what samuel told him and all the people followed him trembling and he tarried seven days according to the set time that samuel had appointed but samuel came not to gilgal and the people were scattered from him and saul said bring hither a burnt offering to me i cannot wait anymore i cannot wait anymore i will not wait anymore after all i'm a king and he's just a prophet after all i am in control i'm in charge you know you may be in charge but your patience can be tested your endurance can be tested and your confidence in god can be tested and so he said bring me hither a burnt offering to me and a peace offerings and he offered burnt offering perhaps he was saying after all the important thing is to know how to do it well and i can do it well i mean does samuel have to do it all the time i have watched him doing it every time and i know how he does it and he even mentioned it to me the two things they will do he will offer burnt offering and peace offering and i will do it and uh, it doesn't matter to god who does it maybe that's what he thought the important thing is to do it and therefore he did it he did it in verse 10 and it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering behold samuel came it was still on the seventh day at the close at the end of the seventh day and when when and samuel went out to meet him that he might salute him and samuel said what hast thou done have you feared in this test of life what is it you have done have you been waiting and have you waited until i came oh the people were scattering and so what that's what made you fail your test there is no excuse for failing the test and he said Saul said because i saw that the people were scattered from me and that thou camest not within the days appointed that the philistines gathered themselves together at mikmash therefore said i the philistines will come down unbelief had come now the philistines will come down now upon me to gilgal and have not made supplication unto my unto the lord i forced myself therefore and i offered a burnt offering and samuel said to saul thou hast done foolishly you have failed your test you have failed your test thou hast not kept the commandment of the lord thy god which he commanded thee for now would the lord have established thy kingdom upon israel forever but now thy kingdom shall not continue samuel what's the matter the man has not committed adultery the man has not stolen any money well impatience is as terrible as any other thing that man has failed the test of his life the kingdom shall not continue 
my brother, my sister, do you ever realize in this church, sometimes you want to be useful to the Lord, you want to do something for the Lord, and the Lord has been giving you dreams and revelations. And from those dreams and revelations, you know, oh, I'm going to be a mighty preacher uh, to the glory of God. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And eventually, when you feel that the church is too slow, you say, well, I think I have to do something. And you push yourself and you do something. And then God says, you have done foolishly. You have failed your test. Now, that thing you have been seeing in the dream and in the visions, and uh, I've been talking to you in the revelation, that thing will not happen anymore. Oh God, you know how much I love you, how much I want to do this. No, you have failed the test. It is a delicate thing that many people have missed in their lives. In verse 14, but now, thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be captain over his people. Because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. And so, in our lives, let us be patient. Then there are days of pressure. I'm sure some of us... Uh, Men in the church, you have felt the days of pressure. You are getting older, and the pressure is coming from left, right, and center, from your parents, from your colleagues at the place of work. And the pressure is coming from your own body. The pressure is coming from everywhere. Get married, get married, get married. And your mother is putting pressure on you. Your, the villagers are putting pressure on you. Your friends are putting pressure on you. Your colleagues in the place of work are putting pressure on you. Days of pressure. They are testing times. And uh, you know, when that pressure comes like that, it will be a time of testing. And you know, sometimes uh, in your own life as a Christian worker, there are times that pressures will come and the pressures will be saying, you know, decide now, do this immediately, do this immediately, do this immediately. Oh, you say, well, let all things be done decently and in order. Oh, no, all the other people around in the church, they will say, no, uh, we cannot wait anymore. Do it right now. Let all things be done decently and in order. Let's be patient, let's be orderly about it. But no, the pressures will come upon you. You know, those pressures on a pastor, on a Christian worker, those pressures on a man or a woman uh, in your private life, they pose as testing time and testing period for every one of us. That's why you ought to be careful. In John chapter 6, John chapter 6, verses 5 and 6, when Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he says unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? Those were days of pressure for them. Hours of pressure. The people had uh, congregated together. They had listened to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then now, they were hungry. And you could see it on their faces perhaps. And uh, looking at the midst of the disciples, there was, no, there was no food. Nothing they will eat. What pressure upon a preacher that has called all the people together in a retreat. Pressure. And in those days of pressure, my brother, my sister, you'll be tried, you'll be tested. And Jesus said unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? Look at verse 6. This he said to prove him, to test him. For he himself knew what he will do. He himself knew what he will do. And yet he posed a question to him and said, Philip, look at all these people, how many they are. Look at the hunger on their faces. Look at some of them already coming saying, uh, is there any food? Is the food ready? And they are putting pressure on you disciples and apostles. Where shall we buy bread that they may eat? It was a test. He knew what he will do. A miracle was on the way, but he did not immediately tell them. You know, sometimes it's like that. And it's, so it only takes the person that knows that it's a testing time for me. And then the Lord will be able to see you through. Point number six. Decision on priorities. There are times that we are faced with priorities and we just need to decide what we are going to do. In our personal life, in our business life, in our family life, in the church life. And we have been following after the Lord for some time but... 
uh, this uh, moment has come where we are called to make a decision and uh, your flesh will be hustling for something why not take decision in this on this line your friends will be hurrying you up why not take decision on this line and the old denominational colleagues uh, those who knew in the old denomination before where you have left they'll be saying well why not just uh, come back and get settled and we'll accept you back again and then you have difficulty as to how are you going to take decision now it's a testing time it's a testing time if you pass there will be promotion there will be progress there will be achievement if you fail it will be that it will be so bad in second chronicles chapter 32 second chronicles chapter 32 let me read uh, for you from verse 22 thus the lord saved Ezekiah and the inhabitants of jerusalem from the hand of Sennacherib, the king of assyria and from the hand of all the of all other and guided them on every side and many brought gifts unto the lord uh, to jerusalem and presents to Ezekiah, king of judah so that he was magnified in the sight of all the nations the, thenceforth and in those days Hezekiah was sick to the death and prayed unto the Lord and he and he spake unto him and he gave him a sign uh, the story is told uh, fully in another passage uh, of the Bible and it says that God added 15 years to the uh, to the life of uh, Hezekiah but look at verse 25 after he had received such a sign, such a wonder, such a miracle, but Hezekiah rendered not again according to the benefit done unto him, for his heart was lifted up. Therefore there was wrath upon him and upon Judah and Jerusalem. Notwithstanding, Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart, both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord came not upon them in the days of Hezekiah. And Hezekiah had, had exceeding much riches and honor. And he made himself treasuries for silver and for gold and for precious stone and for spices and for shields and for all manner of pleasant jewels. So houses also for the increase of corn and wine and oil and stores for all manner of beasts and coats for flocks. Moreover, he provided him cities and possessions of flocks and herds in abundance for God had given him sustenance very much. This same Hezekiah also stopped the upper watercourse in Gihon and brought it straight down to the west side of the city of David and Hezekiah prospered in all his works. How be it in the business of the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon who sent unto him to inquire of the wonder that was done in the land. God left him to try him, to test him, to prove him that he might know all that is in his heart. He had been prospered by God. Even though he had uh, gone wrong in his life, he repented and humbled himself and, himself and God forgave him. And then now, in the case of the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon that came after he had been made whole, they came and then God left him alone to see what decisions he will take what conversation he will get into, what agreements he will get into with them. He left him alone to take the decision of his life without divine guidance. And he did that to try him, to know what is in his heart. You know, sometimes uh, you are praying and asking God about something, a step you are to take, about some friends, about some colleagues, or about business partners, or about some decisions in your life about a life partner and God is quiet and silent to know what is in your heart to know whether you will move on without his guidance to know whether at the time of decision and priorities whether you will fail the test and disappoint God I've told you that God doesn't tempt us with evil but he opens up doors and avenues and opportunities whereby we are tested to know what we have what we are and to know how matured we are and to know whether we have really grasped and learned the lessons of our lives and these areas i've talked about today on deception of prophets difficulties in poverty the leakage of prosperity 
delay of promises, days of pressure, and decision on priorities. They open up avenues for you whereby you can watch your life and know that the test may come anytime. But the Lord is saying, if you look up to him, if you will depend upon him, in the day of test, he will see you through. In the day of test, he will hold your hand. In the day of test, he will give you grace to sail through and grace to overcome if you depend upon him. But if you look back and you drop back and you fail in the test of life, the plan of God may be frustrated in your life. And what the Lord intended for you to do in life, those things may not be possible. But I'm praying for you that you'll recheck your life, re-examine your life to see that we all pass in the test whenever the test will come. Rise up and let us pray. Looking back at your life, haven't you failed many tests already? Wouldn't you go before the Lord and tell him you're sorry? And then ask for grace so that whatever test will come, whenever test will come, however tests will come, you'll succeed. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord. The tests are always there. How do you do in the tests? Have you been doing in the tests? Have you been deceived by false prophets? Have you murmured and grumbled and complained because of poverty? Have you become self-indulgent and greedy because of prosperity? When the promises were delayed, delayed for a week, delayed for a month, delayed for some time, how did you react? When pressures came upon you from friends and colleagues and neighbors and relatives, do you stand firm? When you want to determine the priorities of your life, wanting guidance from the Lord, are you able to wait until He gives you the answer? Or do you take your life into your hand and do as you please? In the doctrines of the Bible, the tests will show. How well have you learned the lesson of forgiveness, the lesson of love, the lesson of patience, the lesson of humility? The tests will show. How well have you learned the lesson of endurance? The lessons will show your reaction to the lessons of life and the tests of life.